Good morning. We're so excited to worship with you today. Jesus said, who the sun sets free is free indeed. So let's celebrate the freedom that we have in Jesus. Amen.
you and we thank you that you have been that perfect love you have been that perfect love to all of us father god and you're not a love that is impatient god you're a love that is patient and kind and not only have you loved us with that perfect love but you've shown to us you've shown us the way to love others father god to see them as you see them, Father God, to not be easily annoyed or drawn to anger, Father God, but to see them with the unconditional love that you have shown to each one of us. Father, at the end of this season, God, this remarkable time, let us not leave the same way we came in. Let us leave closer to you, Father God, closer to the, the design that you made, God closer to the, the idea that you had when you created us and closer then therefore to one another god we just praise you we praise you and we give you every glory we give you every glory god in our triumphs and our sorrows we give it all to you and we praise your name forever in jesus name that we pray hallelujah Well, it's a pleasure worshiping with you online and we want to thank Pastor Jody and his worship team for always providing these great worship sets, both Sunday mornings and during Wednesday worship. Um, that's a lot of hard work and we've really been the beneficiaries of that as we've worshiped in our living rooms and elsewhere. It's been a great time even in this quarantine uh, as we've devoted ourselves to worship and prayer and lifting up the Lord's name. Uh, exciting news this past week, we sent out an email saying that we're going to be meeting in person coming up. And you, you saw that it's on May 31st. So in two weeks, we'll be meeting um, in person. And if you want to come to that, you have to register. So we need your accurate email address. If you want to email us at, beachfell at info at beachfellowship.com or david at beachfellowship.com, just let us know what your email address is. We'll get you on our list. Or you can go to beachfellowship.com the website and click on the online community. But regardless, we need RSVPs for that because we're going to be limiting seating capacity in here to under 50%. And so we're going to be preparing for you. We're not going to have children's ministry during that time. Uh, we're going to take that a little bit slower and, and we're obviously very prayerful about this whole thing and we'll continue with online services beyond. Um, so this week and next week, the 24th and then beyond, we'll have online services. But to come on the 31st, we're, we're really excited. We're all just beaming to be able to see one another again and see each other in a safe way. Uh, we'll be taking all the necessary precautions with um, all the safety precautions, disinfecting and having masks. We're strongly encouraging everyone to wear masks, but it's gonna be a great time on the 31st. So sign up for that. And leading into that, we're gonna be very prayerful. In fact, Jesus, um, that's gonna be, Pentecost Sunday, by the way. So that's 50 days is on the church calendar, 50 days after the Passover, 50 days after Jesus died and rose again, came Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church in a new way. And before that happened, 10 days before, Jesus turned to his disciples and he, he told them to stay in Jerusalem and to pray and to devote themselves to prayer and wait for the Holy Spirit to come on them. And that birthed the church. Jesus Christ's church was birthed at that moment. And even today, the church of Jesus Christ, obviously quite active, but we need to be prayerful. And so in the 10 days leading up to our reuniting, we're gonna be pray praying together. Um, so look out for emails on that as we devote ourselves to prayer. Speaking of that, I'm going to continue in our service with a word of prayer before we hear Pastor Ray Bjorkman give a message from God's word. And uh, you can also give online. You can give using beachfellowship.com on the online giving button or using the app. But uh, let's pray for that, for our giving, as well as the remainder of the service. So Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to give and we thank you for your word.
We thank you for the chance to meet together, whether it's online or in person. And Lord, we pray that you'd open up our hearts and our minds, our eyes and our ears to what you have to say through us, to us through Pastor Ray. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Sunday service online again. Uh, we are drawing closer to getting back together face to face. And um, if you're a part of our church congregation or want to come and be a part of celebrating and worshiping with, with us, we are beginning in two Sundays live and in color here. We will also continue our online services and opportunities to be able to, to view from a distance. But two weeks from today, we'll be meeting here as well. Two services, multiple opportunities to get together, different than before. But um, you've heard the announcements. And you'll hear more announcements about how and what we're going to do that. But I'm excited to be with you here this morning. On the heels of last week's Mother's Day, we had a lot of great reports um, from families and moms, how they celebrated the beauty of motherhood uh, and as a congregation can't think of a better way to keep going forward and saying, hey, moms, thanks again. Every Sunday should be Mother's Day, but unfortunately, uh, it's not quite that way. So we're going to talk today about living faith. What's the, the purpose of a, a living faith? And uh, I was reminded of the words of, of this great psalmist and warrior and, and king of Israel, David, 
uh, when ultimately he encountered an opportunity to, to do something, to, to, to stand up. It was a, a, a life-defining moment in his life, and, and he uttered this question, and I'm, I'm posing it to us as a church, but David said, is there not a cause? And is there not a cause was as he reflected and he looked and, and he saw the state, uh, not only of the leaders uh, of a nation and of a nation as a whole, but of the times he lived in, and something deep from within him rose up and, and compelled him to utter those words, is there not a cause? And I, and I think it's reflective of so much of David's life was used for you and I as an example of, of a living faith. Not just a faith, uh, not a hidden faith, uh, not, a, not a, a quiet faith, but, but a faith that is actually engaging and doing. I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, of the midwives back in the book of Exodus, who there was an edict that came out from the government at the time. There, there was fear in the government that the, the Israelites were growing too big, the people of God. And, and so the leader of the government said, well, let's just kill the firstborn of, of every male. So this, this national edict went out. And, and, and so there was a, a big struggle there because the people of Egypt and, the, and were, were doing what they were told to go out and search for and house to house find the firstborn males. And Moses was born in that time. His, his, his mother, Jacobed, uh, w- was moved along with the father to, to not do this. So the father made a, a little mini boat and pitched it with our, uh, uh, he, he, he made a pitch all around it, kind of like asphalt tar. Uh, and then they took the baby and they placed him in there. And then they didn't just scoot him down the river. They, they put him and placed him in the Nile where he would be found close to, of all places. And it's just mind-blowing providence. Uh, he would be found by... Uh, the, the king's uh, granddaughter. So uh, actually, uh, his, his, the king's daughter. So Moses was brought into the palace, and then the king's daughter said, well, well who's going to raise this baby? And, and the king said, well, go find one of those Israelite women. And uh, you know the rest of the story, if you know the scripture. Uh, of course, they came and got Moses' mom and Moses' mom got to raise Moses in the palace, you know, right under the, the, the king's nose. And, you know, Moses goes on to lead an incredible life as a, as a deliverer from God. But that's another example of, I mean, is there not a cause? Uh, that's an example of a living faith, uh, torn, perplexing, I mean, wrestling And yet the scripture goes on to tell us that as the babies were being born one after another in the Hebrew community, the midwives feared God above anything else. And and they, they didn't kill the babies. In fact, they worked to have these babies delivered, the firstborn, and, and, and usher them out of the way. And the scripture says to us that the beginning of Wisdom is the fear of the Lord, a reverential awe that above all that we know and live is the creator of the universe, almighty God. And above all, he is to be respected and obeyed. And the beginning of wisdom is that fear. So this living faith is kind of propelled from within in a a young David, is there not a cause? In these midwives who one after the other help birth these these children uh, under a really tough time and risking their own lives, but they were emboldened and they demonstrate a a living faith. We're going to take our portion of scripture today. Uh, It's found in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 2, Old Testament. Uh, It's Samuel K. Chronicles, Samuel King's Chronicles. So, uh, you know, you turn to the second book, uh, the second book of Chronicles in the 20th chapter, and re- we're going to read a, a portion of scripture, but let me, let me set the stage. Faced with an enemy far beyond his power, in other words, it was, it was annihilation was upon this king, Jehoshaphat. The Bible says that the king exhorted the nation, first of all, 
to seek God's face, to turn to God. I, you know, so when real challenges come in your life, in my life, in our family, in our cities and ready, in our nation, in the world, we as God followers realize, first of all, we're, we're going to seek God's face. He's an ever-present help in the time of need, but he's also waiting for us to, in humility, seek him, turn to him. And this king said, hey, we, we've got to seek God. And in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12, he culminates a, a long prayer that you can read on your own. It's about 20, 20 verses. But he culminates this prayer with, with, with his nation and his leadership. And he says, we have no power to face this vast army. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And, and I'm going to talk into those three points here today and try to weave it in together about a living faith. So we have no power to, to face this, this enemy. It's too big. It's too great of an enemy. We don't know what to do. It's a big acknowledgement for a leader, a king. We're always supposed to know what to do. And, and we endeavor here as leaders here and, and prayerful leaders and use wisdom and discretion. That's why we're doing the things that we are doing and how we're doing them. And in the end, but our eyes are on you. The Bible teaches us that it's not by our might, it's not by our own personal power, but it's by God's spirit. Sometimes the, the, the mountains are moved. There, there are things I can do uh, in and of itself, God has given me strength and abilities and acumen and desire and flexibility to do certain things and you as well. But th there are some things that they're, they're above our pay grade is a, a statement. It's out of our reach. And to his credit, Jehoshaphat, the, the leader of a nation, prays this prayer in, in these three things. Hey, we don't have the power. Uh, we don't know what to do. And but God, our eyes are on you. As we struggle in our own lives, let me kind of relate it to where we are today with uh, our own difficult and challenging situations. Some of that's applicable. Uh, we feel the same overwhelming sense of uh, helplessness or, or hopelessness a little bit uh, that Je Jehoshaphat felt. And uh, Jehoshaphat's prayer, though, starts with acknowledging their helplessness. And I, and I think for you and me, that's important. We, we're, we're, we're dealing with a, an enemy that can't even be seen by the naked eye. And, and when it launched, I, I gave the invocation for the city of Virginia Beach's um, prayer, annual uh, uh, hosting of the State of the Union for the city of Virginia Beach that our, our mayor gives every year. And there was a thousand people there. And it was two days, and interestingly enough, two days before our president issued a national emergency. And I remember praying, God bless our leaders here in the city of Virginia Beach throughout the country because they have micro and macro big decisions that none of us really fully understand unless we're in their positions that affect so many, 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 many people. And the Bible even tells us, first of all, let our prayers be given for the men and the women who are in authority, praying for them, for their decision-making so that you and I can lead peaceable and quiet lives, normal lives uh, amongst all. We feel the same way, but he acknowledged his people's helplessness, and sometimes it's just really okay to do that, and it's very difficult for a strong woman or a strong man to just say, oh, I'm not sure. We're, we're taught, especially if we're leading Oh, uh, we're supposed to have all the answers. But, but he also acknowledged that, God, our eyes are on you. The most important part of this prayer after acknowledging in truth is a confident expectation, a confident acknowledgement of who God is and, and, and what his power can do and what his mercy has done for us and for multiplied millions and billions who've lived on the earth and, and his dealings with people in the past. God is, is, 
He is not given to change. I am God and I change not. He's historically there for all people who humble themselves. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he, he will lift you up. God draws near the humble and he, and he opposes the proud. In other words, he just resists. He stays back. If you're arrogant, you don't want to, whatever, he's not going to force himself on you. He loves you and will continue to draw you with cords of love, but he, he, he's not going to get in an argument with you. He's going to love you and hopefully through life, the, the seed of God's word will get in and, and, and open up within you. Maybe, maybe a tributary of a fountain that you've never known before because God loves you and he's placed eternity in all of our hearts. But Jehoshaphat is reminding his people that God has never failed them. Throughout the whole of scripture, God has never failed any people group who have turned to him in humility and earnestness especially when we say we don't want to do. The Bible says in the book of James, Jesus' half-brother said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids you not. In other words, he's not going to chastise you for saying, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do. Jeremiah 6, it reminds me of Jeremiah's words. He says, when, when you come to the crossroad in life, Jeremiah 6, verse 6, we come to crossroads all the time. It says, if you'll first of all stop and you'll ask God which way to go, the Bible says then, then he will show you. And if you walk therein, if, if you walk in what he says to do, the Bible says peace and rest will guard us as we go on our way. But, but oftentimes we come to these intersections of life where we don't know what to do and, you know, we kind of blast through or we keep on rolling and, 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 and much to the chagrin of, of, of God's heart, uh, we had a better way. As we worship God, we may also live in, in faith and love rather than allow ourselves to be overcome by fear. And, and that happens when we turn towards God. He fills us daily with his mercies are new every morning. He fills us daily with hope and, and encouragement. Our whole series since we started this has been a series of hope and, and, and a better expectation. Even though we don't have our handle on everything, how it's all going to work out. I said from the very beginning, the first week, I said, I really feel like this is going to go longer than we want it to be, but it's not going to be as uh, devastating as, as maybe 2.2 or 2.4 million eventually came out was going to be this. But it's devastating, and, it, and it's real. But leading up to a regathering for us in a couple weeks, I want to kind of weave all this stuff together. I remember Mark Twain said these words, what worries me most is not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand, but the parts of the Bible that I do understand. And all God's people said, amen to that, brother Mark Twain. But this morning I, I was praying and, and seeking, and, and there's just a, just an enormous amount of opportunity to speak upon. There's just so much, and sometimes I'm just burgeoning to be able to, to communicate, and i got to narrow it down. But I, but I woke up, and, and an old song came to my heart, and it was David's song that he wrote of many, but it was, it's found in, in, in Psalm 18, and it begins in verse 46. But I, I, I was just, just minding my own business when, the, the, the thing just kind of came up and, and it goes like this. The Lord lives or liveth and blessed be my rock. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. So we used to sing it. The Lord liveth, blessed be my rock. The Lord liveth, blessed be my rock. And exalted be the God who is the rock of my salvation. The Lord liveth, blessed be my rock. And David goes on to write in there and he says, who is God? Save the Lord. And who is the Lord? Save our God. For God is our strength, inner, outer, mentally, physically, lifingly. Lifingly, there's a good word. He, he is our strength and he makes our way perfect, sure. Even in the midst of a terrain and a path and place we don't know, he, he will make our steps sure. He makes our way perfect. The Lord liveth and blessed be our rock. It just, just came roaring up and I, and I couldn't shake it. And, and I know it's an encouragement for me and it's an encouragement for you. The Lord liveth 
and he lives in us and he's given us a living faith. He's giving us a living faith that, yes, gets strained and struggled and tested in times. But, but I remember it was 43 years ago that Jesus wrecked my life. In other words, I personally, uh, one evening, privately, by myself, I surrendered my life to the Lordship and, and Jesus becoming my Savior. Savior and Lord. And that Lord, in other words, I'm going to follow him. Savior, he, he is the one who paid the price for all my junk, all my sin. And, and, and he did that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to pay the price for whoever will believe and receive him. They become sons and daughters of almighty God. There's an internal transition and change as Christ comes to live in you. Christ in us is the hope of any glorious thing to come out of your or my life. But a couple of thoughts. I love unguarded worship and we worship now together in an empty auditorium in an empty sanctuary rather we 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 uh get together and my unguarded worship is is with me and my family and 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 some of the staff a little bit and some friendships what have you but i have always loved unguarded worship and by that i simply mean i love to be with people that cherish God in worship and, and actually cry and worship like God is listening and is here with them. I, I love that. I think it's so real. It's so, so different than the songs that I love that are non-church songs that are inspiring or moving or they, they have a path or a place in my life. But worshiping God is an altogether different thing. And I, and, I, and I just love unguarded worship. But I've also learned in this journey in 43 years that God doesn't just lay out every answer for all of us. Rather, his style that I have seen is he, he stirs up some of the questions inside of us, me, you. And there's nothing the matter with having questions on an ongoing basis. Question until you leave this planet. It's a good thing. It's kind of like childlike questioning God. What does that mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? Some of this comes over time. The Bible says we learn a little here, a little there and as we're going there. But, but the key is digging out, digging out experiences that you can find in the Bible, just like Jehoshaphat. So what did he do? He was humble enough to admit their, their dilemma. Listen, we, we, we got to talk about it. You know, it's, it's not the where we want to be. Number two, he also included everybody involved in it. And as a leader said, I don't have the answer exactly. I don't have all the answers. I don't have it. But number three, and most importantly, he turned them to have an ongoing confidence in Almighty God. An ongoing confidence. I, Pastor Ray, what about this? What about this? What about that? Some of it I know. Some of it I have no clue. It's digging it out, digging it out together, asking the right questions. And then we'll flesh it out as, as God reveals it. But it doesn't mean we don't do anything. So as we move on, I'm going to share with you just briefly an article that a 16-year congressman from here in Virginia, who, who I know, he just wrote this article, Randy Forbes, and, and he talks a little bit back in his journey in the beginning. If you're like me, your life has become a bit disoriented since the coronavirus began. Routines and schedules, uh, what is left of them, they're markedly different. The days of the week seem to blend together and weekends are no longer weekends. They're just other days. Same end to that. We get up differently. We go to bed differently. We're losing order in our lives on some level and it changes us. It changes how we feel. It changes how we act. And it can greatly impact how we view our lives. By the way, Randy is a, is a devout Christ follower. When I was a young teen, teenager, he went on to say, I remember one summer when I stayed up late at night, slept until noon the next day, and I sat around watching television for most of the afternoon. I was doing what I wanted to do, as most teenagers like to, when I wanted to do it, as everybody would like to. At first, this was great, but after a couple of weeks, I became miserable. I blamed it on everything else, anyone else, but I realized that I lacked order in, in my life, and it was me, my decision-making, in response to this freedom, 
was causing me not to keep first things first. So church, hear that. First things first. God is a God of firsts. Those few weeks taught me that there was a consequence to pay for that failure. So as a young man, I determined never to repeat that again. Then he writes, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. And he said, God warned me about this, but I didn't really recognize the scripture or didn't want it yet. The backslider in heart will have his fill of his own ways. But the good man will be satisfied with his ways. When we order and bring some orderly and allow God to, to restructure and reorder our lives and we put first things first, you know what happens? It's evening and it's morning and there's another day. When, when we let ourselves fall apart into these things, into this sleepy, dreepy, uh, well, I can't do anything about it, so why try? You know what comes at the end of that? Just being miserable. Congressman Forbes went on to say these words. Many governors and mayors across America did not keep first things first. They issued orders protecting Walmart, Lowe's, and stores selling alcohol products, but kicked churches to the curb, even when they were following safety guidelines set down by those very same orders. While this was going on, other leaders have realized the importance of keeping faith first in our lives. One of them, by the way, billionaire, never needed to work and do this, never needed to take on this task, never needed to move into the sector of our nation that is overwrought with disinformation. But Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos wrote earlier this year, there's a reason why our First Amendment comes first. Our country was founded upon the first freedoms that it protects, the freedom to express ourselves through speech, through press, through assembly, through petition, through faith, all of these things define what it means to be an American. Other leaders throughout our country are doing similar things. In Virginia, he wrote, 200 pastors wrote a letter to the governor challenging his discrimination against churches. That, that's appropriate and, and healthy. It's, it's, re, it's redressing, the, the ability to redress something that you have a differing opinion on. In Georgia, the governor, he writes, held a prayer vigil. In Texas, the governor gave an interview encouraging people to lean on Jesus. Courts are issuing rulings declaring governors cannot suspend the First Amendment. The Department of Justice is joining cases to support religious freedom. Kentucky courts ruled that to support churches against the governor. In Kansas, a federal court supported the church over the governor. In Mississippi, the governor and other state leaders stood against a local mayor who tried to stop driving churches. And he said, we're seeing legislators who are part of the Congressional Prayer Caucus taking stands everywhere to keep first things first and to keep faith in America. By the way, the Congressional Prayer, Prayer Caucus, Randy Forbes started as a congressman in the United States of America, and it goes on today, and it's thriving. He went on to write these, this. While this should encourage us all, it should always remind us that we need to also put first things first. Uh, you may not be able to issue an executive order or join in a lawsuit, but you can take simple action to, to make an impact. We can put starting with putting first things first in our lives and in our own homes with our own families. We also must never stop working to make certain we're putting first things first in our country where we live. One of the first things we can do is support and thank those leaders who are fighting for us. When, when you're not on the front lines, he went on to write, showing gratitude for, for those who are can be one of the first things you can and should do. I encourage you to reach out and thank someone for the stands that they're taking and the sacrifices that they are making. The stands that people are taking, living faith. The sacrifices that they're making, living faith. Kudos beyond words to everyone who's got their sleeves rolled up and said, answer to David's question, is there not a cause? You betcha there's a cause. We do it sacrificially. We do it respectfully. We do it continually. But we, we, we don't need to muzzle the ox. Well, the ox is treading out the corn, and, and that's another sermon for another day. 
as, as we get a chance this week, send one of them encouraging notes to uh, show appreciation. Tell them how much you thank them for putting first things first in our country. Thank you, Randy Forbes. When, when, when you hear a, a very bright 16-year congressman, happens to be from our area in Virginia, engaged in, 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 in the political environment which God's called him to and engaged and continue to pray for and, and not taking the white towel and throwing it in saying, hey, it, nothing we can do about it. No, no, no. He's focusing on the third part of Jehoshaphat's prayer where he said, God, you, we place all of our confidence in you because you have always been there. And it's an a statement for all of us to remind ourselves and to speak it and to speak it in front of your children and your children's children and your life and your friends and whatever. Even when on the inside, we're wrestling at times with, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm straining with this. But I believe, and I'm gonna close with these things, we're a generation that's waking up. I, I really do. And sometimes it takes a big stirring to wake Somebody up. Remember as teenagers, uh, we, we've got some grandkids and they flat love, love to sleep. And when it's time, you're trying to transition from nap time to maybe moving away from nap because they're starting to get big enough. Man, you know, you, you might as well try to be taking candy away from a child as, as waking them up from a nap when they're in deep slumber. But the church is being aroused. We're, we're being shaken God said, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. God, let it begin with us. Let us show and live living faith, not for a few moments, not for a few months, not for a few years. Well, oh, this is the, the next thing. No, for, throughout our whole life, maintaining this inner burning, the, the, the zeal of God that's a fire within us that doesn't consume us, but it compels us to engage people in a rightful manner with the passion of, of all the stories we could ever talk about. Hey, you, you a believer in, in Jesus? Uh, no, I'm not. And, hey, you, you want to talk about that? Sure, I would. Well, there we go. It's, it's the start of doing what we can do, showing, because is there not a cause? There's a huge cause. And as more people are, are, are waking up, I believe that we're going to be one of these places where we might see soon the fire of God coming upon a lot more people that you didn't recognize before because God will always light on fire anyone that's willing to put their heart on the altar. He'll, he'll light us on fire and, and fire for a whole new dimension of our life. We as a church want to be a part of the, a new dialogue that uh, integrating the gospel with 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 our society in an active way. We as a church have poured well over $100,000 to our city years ago when, when they stood up and said, hey, we hear everybody. We want to do more for the homeless. We didn't just gather money and write checks. We're not the biggest church. We're not the, we're, we're not the wealthiest church. And but we did it because we were impelled and compelled to do it. But how did that come about? Because we were doing homelessness ministry and have been doing it for quite a while and have continued to and grown in it because we want to mix the two together, what we feel and what we do, making that one, not talking about it, not monologues, but doing it. It's the doing that shows this a living faith. I'm convinced that there's an opportunity for us now to see the church come alive, to see the church advance, and to see the church of God become amazingly more prominent in our nation and in the world because of what we're going through. So let me take a moment, this is separate from this sermon, and talk about we're going to have 10 days of prayer leading up to the day we return together in this congregation. It happens to be Pentecost Sunday. That's two Sundays from this, this message. And when Jesus left, and, and of course for the disciples and all their followers and, 
uh, it, was, it was still a dilemma. You know, you can't leave us. But the resurrected Christ spent 40 days with them. And then at a meal, his last meal on earth, not the last supper, that was before he got crucified. This is the last meal on earth. And, and at a meal, he, he turns and, and, and he says to them, hey, gang, I, I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. The Father's promise, the promise of the Father. Because you shall become my witnesses in the earth. And so what is he talking about? He's talking about power from another world. Power from outside of what they knew. Power from outside of what they've experienced. Power that was coming. And he said, go pray until. He didn't say pray 10 days. He didn't say pray 30 days. He didn't say 50. There were 500 that started. Within 10 days, it was down to 120. When the church of Jesus Christ was birthed. And the Holy Spirit of God came, rested upon, and then filled every one of them in the upper room. Church, with all my heart, I think all of the timings of these things work well. We're phasing into getting back together. We, we've done an enormous amount of things around here. You're championing the cause of the gospel in your families and your lives. We hear from you, and, and, and we're doing it. It's a living faith. But we need power either for the first time or again, where we spend time in your homes praying starting this Wednesday for the next 10 days until we meet again here on the Sunday of Pentecost where the church was birthed and when they came out of that upper room after praying just for 10 days Praying for power, praying for God's answer, praying for what Jesus said to do, just being obedient to him. That's what we're going to do. And they came and the Holy Spirit came in answer to Jesus' declaration to them, in answer to these people who said, let's pray because that's what Jesus said to do. We're going to do it and we're going to be people filled with new power, fresh power, to be his witnesses wherever we go, loving God, loving neighbors, loving strangers and ready praying for those who persecute us and not holding angst inside. To God be the glory. Get ready, get praying, and let's come back with power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you.